Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brian Bouters. I'm the Pulp developer. Um, and I'm gonna give a talk about operating Pulp in production. Um, and I have a little bit less time than I started with, but um, that's okay. So um, I also wanna say that I work at uh, Red Hat and Red Hat is a really great place to work. Um, and that's uh, how I feel about it. I love working on this team. So, uh, let's see if I get my cursor here. All right, I am uh, the worst person to give this talk. Um, why am I the worst person to give this talk? Because I don't run pulp in production. And um, so what you're gonna hear today is um, some lessons learned that I've heard from users who do run pulp in production. Uh, but you're also gonna hear about um, a, a desire to have a community of practice created around those who do run pulp in production. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about some current activities that are hoping to make that easier, like the zero downtime working group, also some performance and scale testing. Uh, we're also going to hear about containers in production, which is closely related to the two talks that you saw just before this. And then I'm going to call out some topics that are totally unaddressed and that um, we would like to have this community of practice um, begin working with. Uh, feel free to ask any questions along the way. So uh, here's some lessons learned. This is info I've gathered from users I've talked to. Um, so when deploying Pulp, I've heard that uh, in production, I've heard it's a good idea to keep your buildable assets in a repository and commit changes with some sort of a build pipeline. This is feedback from a specific deployment. So they're using Jenkins, so you can use whatever you want um, and have those images. They are actually pushing their images through Quay or some registry. Um, and then they're using uh, tooling that pulls you know, new updates to those images and deploys them on OpenShift. Uh, they're not using the operator. They probably should be using the operator, but they've been doing this for since before the operator was here. Um, and they do this for workflow for kind of three images itself. So um, Pulp itself, uh, an Nginx reverse proxy, and there's an image that does linting code checks, which is something that isn't really Pulp related, but that's part of their deployment process. Um, so I can see two lessons learned here from this. Uh, one is um, a real desire to have the release pipeline or the, the push pipeline for them be highly repeatable. Um, and they do this by making it fully automated. So that's a lesson learned. And the other thing is to, um, they're building additional things around Pulp with this kind of third bullet here um, for you know, making sure that that process happens with quality and repeatability. So those are those are some good ideas to to do if you're deploying pulp. Um, there's an area of right sizing pulp. So this has to do with um, how many resources to deploy. This is a question we get pretty often, um, but it's a little bit difficult to answer. Um, the question is like, well, how many workers do I need? How many um, API workers do I need? How much memory and CPU should they all get? Um, and it depends on your workload. So it's not a one size fits all. So I'll just give two examples of two installations that I've heard about. Um, so this is install one is what I'll call this one. It serves 250,000 requests a day, more or less. Um, it's an OpenShift deployment that's running on, on AWS. So they boot their EC2 machines and then OpenShift is installed that they maintain on top of those. Um, and then Pulp is deployed on top of OpenShift there. And they use an RDS Postgres database. RDS is the um, Postgres as a service option. So um, they're kind of mixing um, pieces that they deploy and manage along with services provided by AWS. Um, that's the RDS database part. And there's no Redis caching here. Uh, so again, 250,000 requests per day. So for Nginx, they have three pods. Um, they're using 100 meg. Um, soft limit, 200 meg, hard limit. Uh, um, these aren't men, megs. Uh, these are like CPU minutes or something like that um, for their CPU and then 128 megs of RAM for each one. Uh, the RAM is really the, I think the more important one actually because um, requests still operate uh, only just with higher latency if there isn't enough CPU, but if OpenShift, you know, if an application needs more RAM than your than OpenShift is or Kubernetes allows uh, for it to have, then it 
gets killed and that's um, that causes an availability event. So that's that's not good. So they're using um, for their Nginx reverse proxy 128 megs uh, for three of them. So that'd be three times that for the total footprint. Uh, for their API requests, it's um, one CPU here. Um, they're using two gigs of RAM for their API requests. Um, and that's definitely a beefier service. Um, then for the content app, they're using one and a half gigs of RAM um, and uh, again, three content apps there. I'm a little surprised this number isn't higher. So I guess that's something that's a lesson for me um, that you can service 250,000 requests with three pods with a gig and a half of RAM each and everything works great. Um, they have six workers, this installation, six pods. So with workers, this, this installation does a pretty good amount of um, task processing. They do, they have a lot of promotion events that occur. Promotion being like copy this content between this, these two repositories. And there's a lot of that going on. So they, you know, what was right for them was having six pods. Um, we'll contrast this worker count against the next installation. We'll see. Um, 256 and 512 uh, RAM per worker. Um, they're not needing more than that, but some other content types like RPM, if you're performing large repository syncs, for example, does require more than that. There's just large, much larger metadata that gets um, handled in memory by workers for other content types. So um, this is maybe a good place to start. Um, and this is their RDS database. So they use an eight vCPU, 32 gig RAM, 100 gigabytes of disk. Um, Pulp's database usually doesn't use a lot of disk. It has a lot of records, but the records are very small. So, um, but there are a lot of records. So you tend not to want, you know, it's a database heavy application. So you don't want a very light database. Um, this works very well for them. Installation two, uh, serve six and a half million requests per day. Um, so that's, well, probably 10 to 20 times more um, than the other installation. Uh, it's also an OpenShift. Um, it's not an AWS, but it doesn't really matter. It's still OpenShift, kind of Kubernetes based. It, um, yes? Yeah, Ben, can I ask a question? So, relevant to the install one. So yeah, sure. I see uh, the API, they have allocated like 1.5 GB or something like that, right? So for that, so I, I don't understand why it requires so much memory there. Um, do you, what what API does? So API may be giving the con so content is going to serve the content and worker is going to download the stuff and the API is going to re redirect the request. And whenever you may require some artifacts, query or something like that, if you place then that maybe API serves, but is there any other functionality um, API is running? I'm trying to understand yeah. what, what is the role API will play and why it requires so much memory? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, in this case, because of the, so generally speaking, the API shouldn't require very much, um, but in this case it does, and I'll try to explain why. Um, so usually the API is just for kind of um, administrative, not administrative, but like, um, commands that don't deal with handing out large and large amounts of content. So typically the API handles commands like create this repository, change its name, create a remote. Okay, now sync. Um, and then the syncing is, for example, is actually handled by the workers. So, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot to be handled by the API. Um, but relative to, to, for instance, the content app, which is handling out, you know, I expect the majority of request load to go to the content app, like, you know, 10 to one, or maybe even hundred to one, maybe more than that. Um, because, you know, handing out content to clients, to a large number of clients is mostly what Pulp does. Um, but in this case, so the API has one other really important function and it's that some plugins use the API for handing out content. And in this case, it's using Pulp Ansible, um, which does do, um, some, you know, some of the, like when a client requests a piece of content from Pulp, it actually first interacts with the API and then eventually gets redirected for the binary data to the content app. Um, so it's each client request is kind of handled 
you know, a client requesting content some, with some plugins requires multiple requests to the server and some of them land on the API here. So I think that's why this one is, um, is so. Well, you know, and handling thing. uploads, did you mention uploads? Uh, yes, no, I didn't. Thank you for saying that. Um, the other thing that the API does is it handles uploads and this installation is handling some uploads as well. So it's receiving content. Uh, upload. Yeah. So uh, that is we are saying export. I, I didn't get what is upload here. Uh, upload being um, a, I am a user and I have a piece of content like an Ansible collection or an RPM and I want to deliver that into pulp on the server. So I'm going to upload that um, binary data to pulp. I, oh, okay. I also suspect that this um, installation might have the container plugin installed to serve a container registry. And whenever you perform a push of an image, uh, you're also using the AP, the Pulpcore API service. So okay, okay. So those layers can be pretty big, and so you want to have a good amount of memory. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for asking this question, and also thank you for helping me answer it. Um, the the thing I want to point out from this little conversation is that it can be hard to get right. And what's right for one installation isn't right for another. And that's partly why I'm so interested in having a, um, a community of practice that can help share best practices because it's highly plugin dependent in some cases. And there's a lot of plugin, you know, we have a lot of plugins and then if you're using two of them specifically, like, well, what does that mean for your deployment? So, um, other questions are welcome. Um, so this is the installation number two. I say it's not on AWS, I think, because I'm not totally sure. But then I also know they're using an RDS database. So actually, I think it has to be on AWS. But regardless, um, it's running on top of OpenShift. And um, it does not use Redis caching. These likely should be using the operator and should be using Redis caching. Um, it's an older install, and it has the resource manager. Um, again, six, six and a half million requests per day. They run their Nginx with two pods, 64 meg, 128 meg. So that's a, that's a very light aspect of the installation. Their API though, this is the big one. So it's 32 pods and they use a gig to a gig and a half of memory for each. So the dominant footprint here is, um, you know, it's about 32 to 48 gigs. Um, of memory here. Is that the right amount? I mean, that's a hard question to answer, but I can tell you that that's an amount that creates a flat line latency response for not only six and a half million requests per day, but um, you know, if, if, if most of their traffic, for instance, is actually originating in the US during business hours, well, six and a half requests per day is really six and a half million requests over like six to eight hours and there's a spike at 9 a.m. And so this is, in a lot of ways, kind of statically provisioned to a peak capacity. This is another reason why things like the operator are so significant, um, because they can provide some, in the future, more dynamic scaling based on traffic needs. But anyways, um, this is what their installation uses. Uh, they have a resource manager. This is a very old installation. Um, it uses very little resources, um, 256 meg. I don't even think it needs anything nearly like that. Uh, they only have two workers because this, even though it's a large request volume, um, they don't have a lot of tasks that are are being run. So they only have two. Sounds workers. like the content doesn't change much. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, I think it's like primarily uploads and a huge amount of downloads, and so it doesn't change very much. That's a good way to characterize this. Um, they use a bigger database, sixty-four gigs of RAM. Um, on the database, but not a large database, and 16 vCPUs, that's double the previous installation. All right, uh, moving on to some of our other content. Um, so here's a story that they told me. Uh, the use, they had um, retained repo version, which is a setting that will auto-delete repository versions that are older when new ones are made. They had that set to one, and then there was a bug or a user error. We're not, they're not entirely sure which. Um, and it accidentally dentally created a new repository version with no content in it. They effectively like, you know, made a repo version that deleted all their content, not from pulp, but from 
the repository. And because they had this setting set here, they had no great record of like, they had no opportunity to roll back basically. So, you know, to them, they were like, well, we don't, we are not going to do rollback. That's not part of what we care about. Okay. But maybe you should leave this number higher than one. Um, and that's the lesson learned here. So that's the story I came to tell. Um, uh, here it is. Uh, having more repository version history for rollback is probably a good safeguard. That's a good idea. Um, they ultimately did make a full recovery because some of their other repositories had copies. All right, um, I'd like to talk about a community of practice for pulp um, in production. So um, I think the definition is helpful. A community of practice are a group of people um, who share a concern for something they do and they do it better together and they, by interacting regularly. Um, I think there's a general interest. So if I break this down on how to make this successful, this definition is helpful. Um, I think there's a general concern by people running pulp to run it better. Um, there's usually a, some sort of financial incentive there also. So that I think is solid. Um, people, so this first part's easy, but getting folks to interact regularly, that's the really, really hard part about what I'm um, trying to create here. So um, the, the way to, the way to do that successfully, I think, um, is to make it as lightweight as possible. Um, so I'm proposing that we do this asynchronously and with super low effort to have the most participation. Um, and here's my proposal at doing it, but if you have an idea of what to do, that would be great as well. Here's a link. Um, my slides are linked in the schedule here if you want to actually see the link, but what you'll find is it'll take you over here to discourse. Um, where I started a thread called Community of Practice Running Pulp in Production. Um, what I'm asking folks to do is to, um, if you're running Pulp in Production, come and watch this thread. That way you'll receive updates. And also go into the community section of Discourse, which is over here, and post a problem or a configuration or something that um, was significant to your production usage of Pulp. Um, that's kind of what this area of discourse is for. And um, what I'm going to be doing then, and, and what I'm inviting you to do as well, is to use this thread as an aggregator. So um, rather than discussing all the detailed parts of any given topic, we can just put links as kind of like a jumping off point into like an index of a bunch of topics. Um, and you can see I'm trying to do this pattern here. Um, by linking into two other areas that I want to talk about next. Uh, so one of them is the zero downtime working group. Um, I'm not going to go through what this thread means and does, uh, but the idea is that um, you have to, if you want to upgrade pulp, you have to stop pulp um, and then up, perform the upgrade and then bring pulp back online. And that involves downtime with every upgrade. So that's something that we want to improve. That's a real challenge when running pulp in production. Um, if there's a question, I can't see it. Maybe someone can help me. It's just, uh, I raised my hand, Brian. Um, time check, you've got four minutes. Perfect, thank you. I think I'm on pace for that. Um, so uh, this is one of the ways that we're trying to make um, pulp better by having zero downtime upgrades. Another thing I want to point out here is that we're uh, doing some performance and scale testing for content serving. So the test plan of it is here. Um, you can read all about it. Basically, it's going to look at how we're going to be load testing um, to provide some sort of a report more than these anecdotal um, uh, anecdotal numbers about what you know, like how how what have we observed in terms of like, hey, how many requests can I serve for this plugin um, with these load types? So. This is another kind of area of production operation that we're trying to focus our resources onto to help you run pulp better in production. So um, please join the community of practice is my, my ask uh, here. Um, so the last two last topics, they're short and easy. Um, one is containers for production. So uh, you've heard a lot of two talks today about um, pulps kind of focus on using containers. Um, on the schedule, you won't see, I don't think, any talks about using the installer. Um, and that's because um, this is my personal belief based on the feedback I've heard, which is that Pulp is hard to deploy. Um, and things uh, like, so 
one of the reasons it's hard to deploy is in a lot of ways because the Ansible installer is hard for people to use, um, but it's also hard if it doesn't go perfectly for people to debug to figure out what to do next. Contrasting that, containers are a huge opportunity because they're very easy to deploy. Um, you can start one up and you have a whole pulp system like Mike demoed. You can start um, a cluster of them with kind of local orchestration with Podman Compose, Docker Compose. You can use Kubernetes and deploy them right on EKS or on OpenShift or on Kubernetes that you run yourself or have hosted. Um, you don't have to deal with, oh gosh, is my operating system supported? You just run the container. It's super easy. So um, this is a big theme going forward, but this has real implications for our users who are already using pulp. And so to get this right, we need involvement, for example, in things like the community of practice. Um, so that's uh, a focus on, we're having a focus on containers and this is gonna be significant for production users. Um, so what do we need? We need feedback on the operator in production. We need feedback on container usage outside of Kubernetes. And we want feedback on upgrading um, your Ansible-based installer of Pulp to a container-based install of Pulp. So that's my ask for participation in the community practice. And lastly, here are some topics totally unaddressed. These are things that are really important that um, uh, I'm not a user of Pulp and I'm, I'm not an administrator of Pulp and Production, so I'm not in a great position, an position to answer, but um, we need a focus on monitoring. How do you monitor Pulp for its availability, for its, um, uh, for its throughput, things like that. Um, errors, you know, are errors happening? Uh, we need more information about configuring it with external logging systems. If you're running a serious installation, you're going to do that. Um, we need documentation on better on how to use it with AWS RDS databases, on how to deploy it on EKS, how to configure it with Amazon MemoryDB for Redis. Um, we need better documentation on how to scale it up and down, when, why, how. And also backup and restore use cases, um, and also multi-geography installations. How do you manage? pulp when you actually have n pulps and they're in, involved in different geographies. So um, I don't even have a thank you slide. That is the end of my time. And um, I'll hand it back over to you, uh, Grant. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that we have unaddressed the backup and restore. Uh, did you mean a specific environment? No, not really. And to be um, really accurate and uh, on that, uh, the operator, I believe, does provide backup and, and restore use usage. Um, am I right in yep. understanding that? Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, and, so, and I think it's a matter of documentation is what we're talking about here. Yeah, uh, yeah. If, like, if you look in our docs, just as a non-operator user, um, and that's a great thing about the operator, right? You don't have to know. Um, that's like its whole purpose. Um, so, but if you look in our documentation for everyone else, there really isn't any. And about the scaling up and down the pods, um, did you have in mind to somehow look into the metrics and the telemetry data? Like what we basically were referring to in the previous talks? Because you need some sort of data to base on whenever you do some scaling up or down of the pods. Yeah. Um, what? So the um, I don't believe the telemetry is going to be the best answer to this because that is a one is one. I think we're using that word. Um, we've overloaded the word telemetry. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> so so um, I don't mean the website running at analytics.pulproject.org, but we do need um, telemetry around a specific installation and what are its um, uh, service uh, full of service goals. Um, uh, so for, for instance, um, what I would really like to see is a notion inside of pulp to say, um, uh, or at least even be able to show a metric of here's the 95th percentile of task waiting time. Um, and if that number, you know, maybe that number being 48 minutes is fine for you. Um, maybe it, that number being four minutes is terrible for you. I don't know. But um, getting that information out is a way observability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's that's I, I hope the right kind of I think that's the right kind of way to make a decision, maybe an autonomic decision by the operator around. I'm supposed to deploy more workers. 
So Brian, I'm going to I'm going to step in here because I want to make sure that Odalon has enough time for his talk. Um, if folk have questions, at the, there is a parking lot at the bottom of our schedule, and you know we can add stuff there. Um, but I think right now we need to we need to give Odalon an opportunity. Thanks a lot for your for your talk, and I hate cutting off the great discussion like this. No, it's great. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, you want to stop us, and uh, we'll get let Odalon get his stuff up, and then we'll start the next next session. I just need to.